let's not focus so much on valuations and let's focus on rather creating value and creating sustainable, repeatable revenue. Valuations mm. will come later. Zach, hi. How are you? How's it going, Ronit? How are you? All good? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Sorry about the slightly strange lighting. If you're seeing this on YouTube, uh, like Zach, I'm in a hotel room uh, and there are some snowy mountains behind me, but the lighting is just terrible here. Uh, Zach, where are you today? Somewhere in South Africa, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm normally based in Cape Town, um, which just as just so our, our viewers and listeners are aware has been what in the top five most beautiful cities in the world to live in for like 10 years in a row. But for my sins, I happen to be in Johannesburg for a couple of days. For uh, uh, boo hiss, <laughs> boo hiss. Yeah, but um, yeah, it is it is the middle of the summer here, so um, very very different from that wintry mountain view you have from your from your hotel room. But yeah, greetings from Johannesburg. Greetings, greetings from the commercial capital, the commercial heart of Africa. We also have Gaurav, my partner in crime. Good Gaurav. morning, everyone. Where are you zooming in from today? I'm, you can't see it because I've got a background going on here, but I'm in my mute pod in my office. So I've managed to find a nice secluded spot where we can have our conversations in private, but share it with everyone else that's listening to it. So kind of ironic, but here I am in Dubai and it's cold, believe it or not. It is cold out here. I think I haven't worn a jumper in Dubai for the last 18 months. So I was going to say, I was surprised to see you in a jumper in Dubai, but hey. Um... Oh, don't kid yourself. It's getting cold out here. It's lovely. It's lovely. Good. Run it and bring back some uh, some warmth from Davos, will you? <laughs> um, Zach, you said you normally you normally are based in Cape Town, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. But you didn't grow up in Cape Town, right? Where did you grow up? How did you end up in Cape Town? Yeah, so I grew up actually not too far from where Gorov is at the moment. So I grew up in a small town called Muscat, which in funny enough, in the 1980s and the early 90s, was the place where most Emiratis would go on holiday because Dubai was a little ugly sister of Muscat in the 80s. There was there was nothing in Dubai in the 80s. I mean, I think the tallest building in Dubai was the Toyota building. And now it's one of the shortest buildings in <laughs> Yeah. So Muscat was the place to be because, you know, for lots of reasons. My uh, my father was uh, an economist for the the Central Bank of Oman. So I actually grew up most, I spent most of my childhood, my, the first 17 years of my life in Muscat, in Oman. And um, yeah, gosh, South Africa, how did, how, how did that happen? Um, I, I um, went and studied at uh, this... This college called the IIT. For those that don't know, it's 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 a pretty geeky university in this in in India for a bunch of you know real crazy engineers. So hang on, dude, you're smart then, huh? Uh, well, I just, uh, did I did I know that? Like, <laughs> you're like in the top zero point zero one percent of your cohort or something, right? Uh, it's just I I was I was I was I was just lucky I could I I could solve a few math equations. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, uh, don't forget he's from Oxford. There you go. Of course, I I, I completely forgot that. Much yeah. much easier to get into Oxford than IIT. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> this is going to be a different uh, podcast altogether, guys. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> Um, oh. And then I was, at, I was at Stanford for a couple of years, worked in Wall Street for the next eight years. And funny enough, the reason I ended up in South Africa is just, is the most bizarre thing. I was um, so I was uh, I went through the uh, the crash of 2007 and the crash of 2008. I was at Lehman Brothers for about five years and I I was looking for an opportunity to just get out of the U.S. for a little bit. Um mm. 2010, the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup came to um, to South Africa. Um, and I was like, this is a great opportunity to come to the African country. My, my, my father was born in Tanzania. I don't think you guys knew that. So he spent the first wow. 10 years of his life in Dar es Salaam. Mm. Uh, so I came to Africa, had a blast in South Africa, the World Cup completely. So the uh, the global perception of South Africa prior to the World Cup was very negative because mm. South Africa had the whole taint of 
apartheid and you know isolation and all of that so i i mean most most people that came to south africa came there purely because they had to do work mm. different missions or whatever but but the perception was very negative and then the world cup happened and then everyone was forced to come to south africa to watch a world club most you know just like people were forced i'm being very sarcastic here to go to qatar to watch the world cup you know or last year and then perceptions of south africa just you know beautiful cities lots of food culture music art diversity and i was like gosh this is paradise um so it just goes to show not everything you listen to in the news is accurate um and then i decided to make south africa home um mm. It also has one of the world's biggest, uh, I'm a banker, so I'm going to say cost living arbitrages you can think of. So you can live a cushy life on the ocean in a, you know, three, three story mansion and pay, you know, $2,000 a month in rent. Yeah. And you'd live in a yeah. shoebox, literally a shoebox in Paris or San Francisco, or possibly even Dubai. For the exact same comfort so so that sort of arbitrage very few cities in the world have that and cape town's on top of that list so zach yeah. i need to stop there and rewind about 20 seconds ago did you just say i am a banker i, I was i was a banker. I, I think you used the words banker i mean uh, here oh. you are cool long-haired Rock and no, roll I was a banker. Came. I was a banker. I was a banker for my. You I, were I'm, still, a banker. I'm, I'm, I'm still paying for it now. I'm atoning for my this You're whole thing. Your sins, huh? This whole VC thing is a charade, man. It's just it's. Uh, I'm doing it because I, I'm just cleaning away <laughs> ten years of banking guilt. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god. god, you guys are funny. But yes, the VC thing is what like when bankers grow their hand become cool. I don't know. Listen, some people in Silicon Valley wear Patagonia <laughs> vests. Right? I just do VC in Africa. Oh my God. Yeah, it's like so we need to are killing me. Best, right? <laughs> so let's dig into this VC in Africa thing. I mean, last year it became like, I don't know, 2020, 2021. Yeah, a couple of years, um, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, 2020, 2021, right? It became like a really cool thing. Um, and if you said you were doing VC in Africa, particularly if you were one of our American friends who just discovered Africa, you'd be running around going, oh, X, Y, Z country is the next Brazil or ABC country is the next India. And it's like, but you've been doing this for a long time, VC yeah. in Africa. <clears throat> yeah. Walk us through that journey. Like, okay, you get there, you enjoy the World Cup. You know, it's post Lehman, Wall Street's blown up. You're thinking about what to do with the rest of your life. You find this amazing, you know, cost of living arbitrage. But then how did you get into VC and why, why early stage Africa? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's first of all, a, a, a very long question for multiple bottles of wine. But, but this, the short, the short, we can, sum we can feel <laughs> free to uncork a few if you want. <laughs> Oh man, you're so funny. Um, but listen, the 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 long and short of it, and, and I'd love to hear Gaurav's views on this as well, because mm. he's something you respect in the fintech and just VC space in general, is um the VC industry in Africa didn't really exist until about 2015, 2016. Mm. And I've always said that you cannot create an industry from a top-down approach, it has to be bottom-up. So if you're trying to do VC, and trying to force a square peg into a round hole, trying to mm. do what private equity bankers do and force it into do VC, it's not going to work. So when I landed in Africa in 2010, 2011, there was absolutely no venture capital whatsoever because Africa was always viewed as this region of the world that had lots of resources. So private equity, mm. if you read the McKinsey report, the Lions of Africa from you know a decade or so ago, it was infrastructure, it was mining, it was oil and gas, it was power, and things that you would associate with huge amounts of debt, leverage buyouts, recapitalizations, because the primary assets are resources, mm. minerals, et cetera, agriculture, et cetera. So the idea of venture capital as a way to back fast growing, high impact projects just did not exist. The, 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 I often say there's a big dif difference between the word SME or SMB if you're American and a startup. Right. SMEs have just one 
purpose that is to become or to create value for the family, the principles, et cetera, and to get to profitability as quick as possible. Therefore, SMEs essentially just need working capital finance, which banks and lenders are very happy to provide at often at exorbitant interest rates. And it's a it's a survival business. So the majority of African economies just work as you know survivorships, if for lack of a better word. And it's this constant change of I need to buy inventory, I need to buy supplies, therefore fund me, I'll pay you back. It's I mean, you you get the drift. And all of a sudden, you have these startups in the US from 20 years ago, and then later Brazil, China, and you mentioned India that say, hey, there is another way. Um, and that's where technology made a huge sort of inroad into the way people thought. So until about 2015, 2014, 2015, the concept of anything outside of debt or grant or non-recourse loan financing did not exist in Africa. Um, and the real catalyst for that, I will give credit to the, the sharing economy. The moment you had companies like Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, uh, that were completely um, region agnostic. The moment Uber launched in Africa, the moment Airbnb made, it, it made, made its inroads into Africa, the moment you had platforms like Udemy and Coursera make your way into Africa, you had the investing sort of middle class saying, wait a minute, tech can disrupt education, healthcare, retail, financial services. And there was this concept of there is a way outside of just debt and, and grants. And that was a big turning point in 2011, 2012. And gradually you started to see the first remnants of, I wouldn't call them VC, I call them growth equity firms. Um, but if you look at the real birth of VC, it started with the accelerators and the incubators. Um, unless you have product market fit and accelerators go, you know, play a huge part in creating that, you just cannot, you can't, no amount of VC funding is going to help unless you have product market fit. And um, with, with, you know, I, I remember back in the day, Y Combinator, when they first started, they, I think Y Combinator had its first African startup in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. It was either Paystack or, and then Flutterwave in 2016. Now Africa accounts for almost 20 to 25% of YC's global cohorts. So I think all that trickle me down effect from global accelerators was what ultimately accelerated the growth of VC in Africa that I can obviously talk about later. But that's the, that's a background context and be keen to hear Goro's views in that. So Gaurav, why don't you why don't you jump in and share your thoughts about you know your experiences of VC in Africa and also how you first got involved with Zach. And probably for our audience, I think we should probably for full disclosure purposes uh make it clear that Gaurav and I do have a role with uh, Zach's VC fund as a uh, fintech advisors honorary <laughs> uh, at least for me. Uh Gaurav actually knows what he's talking about. So uh <laughs> You know, we are honorary <laughs> fintech advisors uh, in Zach's fund. So just just so that there's no conflict of interest issue later, why we're a conflict <laughs> fund, we're not. He's just a super interesting <laughs> guy to talk to. Um, Gara, why did you, I was, I remember I was on a treadmill or something, one of my repeated attempts of trying to lose weight, never works. And you said, you've got to talk to this guy, Zach. And I literally took the, my first Zoom call from the gym with Zach, I think. Why did you insist I needed to talk to Zach a couple of years ago? You know, first of all, you guys give me way too much credit. So thank you guys. And to all our listeners, no, I don't pay them to do it. They're really just lovely people and they're very good friends. Um, but, you know, coming back to what you were talking about, Zach, I mean, first of all, coming back to venture capital in our region, in the Middle East, right? And, you know, people put Middle East and Africa together. They belong in a sentence, yes, but they're actually very, very separate entities altogether, especially for people, you know, might be in Europe or might be in in the Americas or, you know, elsewhere, Middle East and Africa, yes, part of the same coin, but really completely different. Um, so when I started exploring the Middle East segment of what was happening at Venture Capital, it was also very young over here. You know, you have a lot of family businesses, you have SMEs, and then you have monopolies with quasi business and government entities. So the infrastructure of how businesses were set up and grew over a three decade period was not very uh, dissimilar to that of Africa, actually. A lot of businesses grew up with that same 
principle and ethic. You had businesses that were SMEs, you had businesses that were legacy, and you had businesses that became monopolies, right? I'm not talking about just telcos, I'm talking about importing goods and fashions and brands. And at the same time that the Middle East was waking up to this concept of disruption, embracing disruption, uh, and also, you know, going through change of actually enabling entrepreneurs with venture capital as opposed to private equity growth, right? It was learning how to do that from other ecosystems like the United States and everything else and, and other ecosystems that were more well developed with venture capital by starting out with accelerators, exactly what, what Zach is talking about. You had tech stars, you had startup boot camp, you have plug and play. Uh, you know, these are actually genuinely the catalysts which educated the wider family offices and gave birth to people and VCs in different guises or encouraged VCs to set up in these ecosystems to, to create the Kareems of this world and everything else that we see you know, today. So that parallel path sat with what was happening in Africa, but I didn't have access to that ecosystem. I didn't have connectivity or wherewithal. And on my many travels to the United States and to India and to Asia, I was building my community of, of trusted people that I could talk to candidly about what was happening in this space. And so then, you know, I, uh, somebody referenced to me and said, you've got to talk to Zach about what's happening out there. And I said, sure, let's, let's talk to Zach. I don't know who he is from, from A to Z, but I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody. And when Zach and I actually spoke, it was immediate that there was one, a fundamental understanding of how business worked today, and two, the opportunity for change and growth at an accelerated pace of return on investment through venture capital in both ecosystems. So we both had the fundamentals of business. We agreed <clears throat> upon that very clearly. We weren't overthinking or we didn't have stars in our eyes that, you know, you could turn $1 into 100 million. We knew it could be a million or it could be half a million or it could be 20x, but over a period of time. But it had to have repeated fund funded investment with people that understood how to help these businesses grow, not just from capital. It needed people who were involved from an advisory position or experience position. And so we got on so well that I remember Zach even said, listen, I, the next day after our conversation, he shared with me in confidence his entire personal portfolio, which he's never shared with anybody, down to the metric of what was going on, saying, this is how I'm viewing Africa. And this is what I've done with my own private capital. And I told him I've done something similar. And I've never shared my portfolio with anyone. I don't publish. Uh, I'm not public about my portfolio of, of the 500 companies I'm exposed to. But I shared it with Zach as well, because there was an immediate kinship of principles, fundamentals, and the opportunity for finding intelligent people where technology and infrastructure had now become a baseline catalyst, which you can't challenge or, or break for people to disrupt and create new businesses and jobs and opportunities, mm -hmm. whether it's Uber, whether it's Kareem, whether it's anything else. Yeah. And it was right. If we tried, if we tried this 10 years ago, it would be impossible. Not the saturation point of mobile phones, the access of the internet, the, the cost point of this infrastructure and accessibility did not exist. It really was frustrating, actually, for people like myself that wanted to be a, an investor and a creator of offshoot businesses 15 years ago. I couldn't do it. It didn't exist in this region. So Africa was exactly the same. So Zach had so many wonderful opportunities and stories. I mean, leading from you know tech stars to, to the banking infrastructure to what was happening with other companies. It just had to happen. And, and for me, I have a, I have a family of, of people I refer to. And when I said, you know, I like to bring good things and good people together wherever possible, and that's where your phone call on the treadmill happened. And I insisted on, on it making it so because I genuinely believe that it's people like Zach and, and myself to some degree. We're not doing things to, for the sake of doing things. We're not trying to do things for a badge of honor, which is why I don't publish. We're doing things because as an entrepreneur who has a hunger and desire and a passion to, uh, to, to, to 
implement change and create jobs, uh, you know, where technology for the sake of technology does nothing for no one. This is this needs to happen. And if I can do it in some small fundamental way, I want to be part of that change and help with my time and money, even though it's an angel check. And I know Zach's been doing it as well. So yeah. the effort will come. People will believe. You have to believe first. And and that's why I know that more people would come. And it happened, you know. And of course, there's a huge risk on these things as it is. <clears throat> you have recessions, you have crypto, you have people, uh, you know, in good spaces and bad spaces getting affected negatively by this change as well. Don't get me wrong. So do I have a crystal ball? No, but good people with good intentions and strong work ethic and effort. If you're in it for the long term, you're not trying to make a quick buck and you have holding power for five to eight years minimum, you can do great things and see good returns. So and, and Africa's, oh my God, it's, it's tough to navigate. And that's, Zach is my navigator. Yeah. Such yeah. a good point, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, let's delve into fintech in a bit more detail. We've talked about VC and entrepreneurship and the Mutual Appreciation Society we've got on between Garo 500 Startup Star and <laughs> Zach Reform Banker, George. Um, <laughs> fintech. Fintech is where we kind of got involved, right, Garo? And why, why were you, Garov, interested in fintech in Africa? And Zach, how does fintech fit into your portfolio? And maybe just to throw a couple of stats out, five years ago, fintech would have been, I don't know, 10% of global VC funding or something. Yeah. At the peak of the fintech, quote unquote, boom, it got up to about 20%, 18, 20% globally. But in Africa, it was 2x that. And in some countries like Nigeria, it was yeah. like almost half of the market, if not more, was fintech. Talk, talk to us a little bit more. The first, Gaur, of like why you got interested and why you pushed me into getting interested in African fintech. And Zach, how, how did you go about investing in that space? And talk about some of the sort of transformative winners you invested in. But let's start with Gaurav. Yeah, sure. So, you know, my background has been in payments. So I've been implementing payment technology in about 14 countries, 15 countries in the Middle East for about 20 years. So I understood the building of technology, the adoption of technology and the deployment of technology. And I've seen this cycle of how long it takes. Mm. And, and you see the accelerated pace of e-commerce. Now, if typical mm -hmm. infrastructure for payment technology from the legacy components takes a build, delivery and wide scale adoption can take anywhere from eight months to 18 months for mass market adoption. In e-commerce, it can happen in three months. And the cost and barriers for entry for that are much, much, much higher. And in, in Africa, the ability for the adoption of technology and infrastructure with smartphone and, every, and other aspects of people having a genuine need for technology. It wasn't a nice to have. There was a need for this technology to happen. The retail market was happening. The SME market was booming. Uh, startups were, were opening up infrastructures to do businesses. Trade was happening. Everything was on the up. And it wasn't being serviced properly because the infrastructure and deployment of this basic fintech that needed there from a banking to a payment to, to lending was so underserved from a basic principle that you could have four or five players compete in the same space in the same market and everyone could still make money and do exits. It, it, the opportunity was, it was just unbelievable as an opportunity. It made no sense to look anywhere else. So for me, knowing the size of my market and my ecosystem here and looking at the giant that is, that is, that is, you know, Nigeria and Kenya and other markets and everything else, it was a no brainer. I mean, it, so using that insight, had to jump on it immediately from, from a baseline. And if you have good people who understood technology, building teams, managing their finances, and growing the company without doing crazy marketing spend, right, first and principal, those fundamentals for me seemed super attractive. And I was very, very happy to invest early on because you mm. knew no matter mm. what, you had a market that needed to be served. Forget, mm. you didn't even talk about competition. The legacy players, yeah. were not interested in updating their infrastructure. And this is another very important thing to understand. Yep. When you're building financial technology infrastructure for the new age consumption 
of consumers and businesses, it's better to start from scratch than to try and fix legacy infrastructure. Because what you're doing is legacy infrastructure is like one of those quilts that you see that get patched with 50,000 patches on it and becomes a nice quilt. But what happens with new technology is you have a single piece that you can work with all throughout whenever you want and just add API infrastructure. It's so much cleaner to work with, so much faster to work with. So even from that perspective, the legacy giants that had the incumbents, as you call them, were mm. already on the losing streak because none of them actually wanted to do a new infrastructure. You look at M-Pesa today, what has M-Pesa done? It's actually bifurcated itself out into a separate entity because it realizes that if it needs to keep its, its, its base of customers and continue growing, it can't sit within an organization that actually kills it from a legacy, not only from a technology point of view, mm. but actually from an organizational point of view. So this is where people just flew quickly and ate market share. I don't need, as a fintech startup, to dominate with 80% market share as a legacy player. With 20%, I'm creating huge value already and taking market share. 20% on my unit economics compared to a banking, massive professional, qualified infrastructure, people with you know, years of experience compared to someone that has five years experience as opposed to 40 years experience. All of these elements just made it completely completely attractive to say, yes, this is the next generation to bet on. And even if I hit on number two or number three or number four, or number five, I haven't gotten to the number one player to begin with, there's still room to do things. And there's still room to grow even today. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So Zach, um, FinTech in Africa, Gaurav just talked about the granddaddy M-Pesa. For a long time, FinTech in Africa was mobile money, right? We were... Ooh. Talk, talk, talk us through from your vantage point of knowing so much about startups, including fintech. What did fintech in Africa look like 10, 15 years ago, five, seven years ago, and today? How, just walk us through that journey from your own personal lens as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, just um, there's a reason why fintech needed to, the fintech revolution in Africa needed to happen before anything else. <clears throat> um, Africa is 54 different countries, but, but what people don't realize is people, people outside of the continent look at Africa as one big region like India or China, but it, it couldn't be further, further from the truth. I mean, in, in South Africa, for example, where I live, no one pays with mobile money. Mobile money was a big thing in Kenya in 2007 when M-Pesa started, but people don't, people just use cards here or EFTs. In Nigeria, you have something called the bank verification number of BVN, which is how everyone transfers money through their bank accounts. Um, if you were to go to a place like Cameroon or any of the 14 Francophone West Africa countries, everyone uses mobile money. Uh, in Egypt, it's very different. So to, to have, in order to enable commerce across the continent, commerce extends beyond just e-commerce, there's social commerce, there's retail. <laughs> you need to have a clear integrated payment back office to be very blunt here. And for that, you needed the Flutterwaves, the Paystacks, the Chipper Caches of the world to actually completely integrate and unify payments across Africa. And that's a lot of plumbing work. It's not easy to do that. So. Unless, so if you look at all the non-fintech companies in Africa today that have done exceptionally well, the M farmers of the world, the market forces, uh, the Andelas, they only exist because the underlying payment infrastructure works. So if we didn't have the Flutterwaves and Paystacks and the, if you take it back to the M-Pesas of the world, you wouldn't have health tech companies, you wouldn't have ed tech companies. So you needed to have fintech as your as your initial sector that that solved the way money moved across the continent. Um, Africa did not. Um, Africa bypassed the entire this this entire this entire. I mean, people. I'll, I'll give you a simple example here. People keep asking me why has Amazon not worked in Africa, right? I mean, Africa is the only continent that Amazon has not been able to grab a foothold in to this day, twenty twenty three. And one of the fundamental reasons for that is Amazon's entire business model is predicated on one thing, credit, right? If you don't have credit or, or, or if there are thin files on your ability to buy, repeat, and purchase, et cetera, 
you don't exist. So Amazon's model today is still predicated on people having a good credit history, which in Africa is not the case. And Amazon has not bothered to do enough of a study on the addressable market and consumer purchasing behavior in the on the African continent to allow an Amazon to work with mobile money or with bank transfers or using alternative credit scoring methodologies. Therefore, they haven't worked. So I think what you really need to understand is, is you know, fintech in Africa is a complex subject. Fintech in the US is digital banking, consumer lending, peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, how do you, how do I split bill payments at a restaurant and you can, and you know, and you can get to a unicorn status in, in New York, but in Africa, like, it's, it's you're, you're solving real world problems, right? So I think that was what attracted me to this, to this market is there is, you could, you could literally just do cross-border remittances between two countries in Africa and get billions of dollars in transaction volume. I mean, between Zimbabwe and South Africa, annually, more than $6 billion moves between these two countries through remittances, right? And who, and who banks those customers? MoneyGram, Western Union. And number three will surprise you, it's taxis moving across the border with huge oh, wow. Power, right? So all of a sudden you have a, a FinTech like Makuru or Mama Money that creates sort of a digital, I call it a digital Havala for those of us that, that know what Havala means. Um, and that platform is now eating into MoneyGram, sorry, yeah, MoneyGram Western Union. And it's allowing people to send money through their, their loved ones across borders at a fraction of the time and cost that these other exchanges have. So I think FinTech provides a layer of innovation that is so real and tangible. Um, take, for example, I'm sorry, I'm digressing here, but, uh, but I think it's important. Take, for example, transportation and logistics, which is possibly the second most funded sector after FinTech. Do you know that the, I mean, for our listeners that are not from Africa, that the average African spends more money on transportation than rent. No. Right? This is not something you think of, but, you know, most people in the West or in Asia or in Europe spend the bulk of their, you know, a third to almost 40% of their, of their income on mortgages or, or rent, right? In Africa, the cost of transportation is so bloody high because of the lack of formal transportation nodes and networks, private versus public, et cetera. So if you can use, sorry, if you can use financial services to reduce the cost of getting, just one second, sorry, not that, um, of getting from A to B, that creates a huge layer of, it, it solves people's, people's, people's problems significantly. So for example, in, in, in a place like Africa, or a continent like Africa, digitizing transport, the ability to do cashless payments for taxis, uh, getting from A to B, and to reduce the dependence on cash in the system, it's a market that wouldn't have existed anywhere else in the world. Um, in, in, uh, in Africa, for example, there's this concept of agency banking. I'm, I'm sure Gaurav yeah. and Ronald, you know about it, but try Try explaining that to someone in New York or London. They'd be like, agency banking? That's <laughs> and the only way I can explain it as a VC so that they understand is they're human ATMs. Where, yep. great, right? great example. Yeah. And they're like, oh, so like as a human being, I can go, I carry an, an electronic float and a physical float. And if you want to buy, I'll take your dollars or Naira or whatever, and I will give you an electronic thing that shows up on your phone. So I become a walking ATM and they're like, that is so cool. Wow. I'm like, this has been an Africa for the last 20 years. And they're like, we should bring this model to the US. I'm like, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> so I just think fintech is so fascinating because you're solving real world problems. And the moment you find that product market fit, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a gift that keeps on giving. And this is why I'm so excited about being in this space, even if it doesn't make sense to you know, VCs abroad, I think eventually they'll come to understand and saying, I can't be building the Brex of Africa, the PayPal of Africa. No, I'm building something that is relevant for our consumers. And with a population of 1.4 billion people growing faster than any other region on the continent, I'm going to build solutions that make sense for Africa. 
and then mm. we'll get those valuations eventually. But let's let's not focus so much on valuations, and let's focus on rather creating value and creating sustainable, repeatable revenue. Valuations mm. will come later. I think that focus on creating value and our valuations is definitely a quotable quote uh, that we're going to have to recycle. Um, you're so right. There are sort of fun foundational problems that need to be solved by fintech in Africa or fintech in Pakistan or maybe fintech in India five, 10 years ago in a way that's different to not knocking what's happened in the UK and the US in the last 10 years. That's been super exciting as well. But it's a different level of problem to be solved. And to the extent that you can, Zach, and I know sometimes confidentiality as an investor will prevent you oversharing, but could you, take us, could you take us inside one or two companies, that fintechs that you've invested in at an early stage and watched to grow and just walk us through like, you know, what country they were in, what was the problem they were trying to solve? Why did you back that particular founder? Yeah. Had they also been to Stanford or IIT? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just on that one, I'll talk about this in a second. And a serious, there is a serious question at the end. I don't know if I was being flippant about the founders, but you, you oh, and I... No, you're not, you're not, you're not. There's, right, a, there's, right, a, there's, right. a, there's a founder privilege right there. Maybe we can I'll talk, talk about... about I'll, talk about I'll talk about founder and schools and all that for like a couple of minutes because it is important. And I mean, I know it that we're all friends and we joke around, but I'm going to be serious for like Isaac can no, be it's serious. it's a super serious. I mean, we've been flippant so, about it, but it's a super serious so, topic in the US, but even in Africa. It's super important. So, so if you look at what happened in, uh, in India in the 80s when I grew up, my father's generation, there was this massive brain drain from India mm. to the US. You had doctors, scientists, uh, mathematicians, engineers, to the extent that the majority of you know, software engineers, doctors in the U.S. during the, the, the upper echelons tend to be from the, the Indian subcontinent and then a large part from, you know, the Middle East, Syria, sort of Iran, et cetera, and, and, and increasingly Nigeria. What, what has happened with engineers, doctors, and scientists in the 80s and 90s is now happening with leaps and bounds in tech, right? Hmm. But what's interesting is it's very easy for someone to knock African founders and saying, well, you're only backing guys that went to Harvard and Stanford and Cambridge and Oxford. And I'm like, you know what? 10 years ago, you didn't have founders that would consider starting a fintech in Africa because they would graduate from Harvard or Wharton mm. or whatever, and they would go work for Goldman, McKinsey, uh, JP Morgan, whatever, whatever. And they wouldn't consider fintech as an option. <laughs> So you're seeing this current generation, if you look at all the, let's talk fintech for a second. If you look at yeah, the top yeah. fintech founders in Africa today, yes, they all went to prominent schools in France, England, or the US. Nothing wrong with that. At least you have these folks that are coming back to Africa, back to Nigeria, back to Senegal, and starting companies like Wave, like Flutterwave, like Paystack, like Paga, et cetera. Yes, they happen to have a alumni at Harvard or at Stanford on their email addresses. It doesn't matter. The fact that they're coming back home and building fintechs is equally important. What I think is going to happen is it'll take a whole generation to have kids out of the University of Lagos, University of Nairobi, the University of Cape Town, to then start emulating their peers from a generation before them, aka our generation. But it cannot happen overnight. Mm. we have to be patient so i'm very happy to look at backing and yes i'm a little biased if a founder went to yc or went to stanford and they're from nigeria and they've come back home and they're building a fintech mm. i will take that seriously but it takes a generation so that's on the 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 education thing which is important to you i mean you know what seven years ago and i'm being politically very incorrect here but the majority of African fintechs had foreign founders. There were very few African founders. Yep. So people were complaining, saying, oh, Zach, you can't just be backing Americans that live in Nairobi and Brits that live in Nigeria. Well, that was solved because a lot of African diaspora came back and started building fintechs. And now they're like, mm -hmm. I call them the, the, the Twitter troll. It's either, oh, you're only backing foreign founders. Now you're only backing Nigerians that went to Harvard. I'm like, when will it end? That's not, that's not true. You back Nigerians who went to Stanford as well. Let's be fair. 
<laughs> but anyway, so so, that, so that's on on the on the uh, on the on, on the founder background thing. Yeah. On the success stories, I'll give you a couple of examples in fintech. So we backed a company called Afriex, um, in, in Nigeria, <laughs> in 2020. They went through Y Combinator in that summer, and they were solving a problem of remittances between. Um, initially just Nigeria and the US. And I'm going to say this for now. I have a slight bias towards founders that start off with a very specific niche and then look at expanding beyond. So everyone wants to say, hey, I do fintech for everyone anytime. Mm -hmm. You'll eventually get there. But start with a niche. And his solution was, Tope's solution was, there is a big movement of money from the Nigerian diaspora in the US that want to move money back home. And they can't do it efficiently in a timely manner and at a and you know at, at a cost that isn't cost prohibitive. So he used stable coins, but specifically USDT and USDC, where he would allow businesses and individuals to move money through his portal, Afriex, just from the US to Nigeria and Nigeria to the US. And initially it was families in Nigeria sending money for school fees for their kids in the US and then people remitting money to their families back in Nigeria. But because he could do that through uh, stable coins, he would hold a big amount of flow to the community pool in Nigeria, convert them to stable coins, send them into a Kraken exchange or Coinbase in the US. Uh, perfectly legit, over the, over the water, CBN, sorry, CBN Central Bank of Nigeria, no problem with that, and it, and, and it solved the real problem. He, he brought transaction fees down from 10 to 15%, which is what the exchanges would, would, would charge, down to 2 to 3%. Oh, oh wow. Massive. Yeah, massive. And he would do clearing in 24 to 48 hours versus you know six to seven days, if not more. So that's an example of a founder that found a niche. He proved product market fit. And this is extremely rare, but he broke even in 12 months. Wow. Right, which is almost unheard of for a fintech, right? And then he said, okay, I'm going to now expand and do the UK. I'm going to do Nigeria, Ghana. But he got a lot of money from investors because he had a path to profitability. You don't have to be profitable, but you have a path to profitability that is very clearly documented. And he then, so, so we backed them at seed. They then went on to raise a pretty significant Series A backed by Sequoia China and Dragoneer uh, Capital. And if you show traction and a clear increase in unit economics over a period of time, eventually the big banks can't ignore you. So now I can't mention who they are, but it's a top five Wall Street bank that's looking to be part of their Series B at you know, a wow. valuation in the several hundred millions of dollars, hopefully later this year. So create value, find a real problem, and then investors will uh, will come. So that's that's a great example of um, a fintech that solved the real problem that we backed very early. Um, another example is a company in um, uh, also in Nigeria. I'll give a non-Nigerian example of a third example, but this one is, is it's a company called Dot, D-O-T, Dot Bank. Um, and they are uh, an agency uh, banking platform, which, like I mentioned earlier, is not something that a lot of people outside Africa adjust, but uh, understand. But it's it's creating a network of agents that allow people in rural parts of Nigeria, so specifically not Lagos, but outside of Lagos, where people cannot transact, they have this massive network of agents. And what's their secret sauce? The founder of Dot Bank used to run the largest um, informal recruitment platform in Nigeria called Jobberman. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. So Jobberman is like the, uh, gosh, it's like the LinkedIn of Nigeria, but for unskilled um, workers. So cooks, uh, uh, hairdressers, uh, not, sorry, not unskilled, but uh, semi-skilled performers, um, barbers, waiters, um, bartenders, et cetera. So he, he's got thousands of people that do part-time freelance work. And he's now taken that network. He had an exit and he's saying, now, let me help you. If if I can help find you work, I can help you move money. And now Dot Bank was born out of that. Again, similar thing now, 
quite a few prominent US VC funds are looking at their Series A um, later this quarter. So again, another great story of, of product market fit. And the last example I'll give of a fintech solution that is quite rare is a company very early stage in Kenya called Stax, S-D-A-X, S-D-A-X dot me. And they have found a very critical niche of offline banking. What does that mean? Um, the majority of people in Kenya do not have disposable income to buy expensive telco data. It costs nearly, you know, in Kenya, the equivalent of 20 to $25 to buy a gig of data, right? Which is not that cheap. You know, it's, it's come down, but you cannot do banking transactions on M-Pesa. You guys know what M-Pesa is unless you're actually online. So what this guy did and his team is he built um, a, 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 a platform called, called Stacks that takes all your offline transactions, right? And he clears them. So, so, so what, he's, what he does is he looks at your credit history and he says, I'm willing as, as a platform to allow you to process transactions when you are completely offline, right? And I will clear them once a day when you go online, right? I'm, 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 I'm obviously oversimplifying it. Um, so you could do M-Pesa to M-Pesa payments. You could do <coughs> payments. You could do, gosh, anything, school fees. I mean, just any sort of bill payments or interpayment transfers without being online. Stacks takes on the underwriting risk and it clears it once you go online. It seems like a pretty trivial solution, but fuck, is it is it is it not trivial? <laughs> the number of people that are like, really, I can do payments now without being online? They're like, yep, we'll take the risk, right? But they're but they're doing it based on your mobile transacting history. So if you haven't been paying your MPESA bills on time, or if you're not refilling or topping up your airtime regularly, you won't be part of it. But if you meet certain minimum requirements, they take on the risk. And it's offline banking, right? And it's done through you. So, so you don't need to be to have data to do USSD transactions. For those of you that that know, I mean, you guys know it. But so it's based on USSD technology, where you need to have, well, you don't need to be online. Now that, if they they play their cards right, could be a massive company. I mean, imagine doing offline banking, right? So, so that's a relatively early stage bet we took about a year ago, and they're busy working up you know, working their way up to, um, to, to, to grow. So yeah, those are just three examples I gave you. I can give you many more, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting time to be alive to FinTech in Africa. Gaurav, I want to let you have the final words. We're heading to the end of this session. What do you think FinTech in Africa is going to look like in the next three to five years, particularly given the, um, the global fintech uh, and risk winter we've been in for the last few months. And if there's any final questions to our friend, Zach, you want to throw at him, including like, you know, when's he going to come and party in Dubai? You know, this is your chance, <laughs> go for it. Well, yeah, I mean, from, from where I'm sitting, you know, as a person that, that sits in the deployment or building of the side of the business, it, for me, you know, I, I tend to work with and, and have a lot of faith with, non-sexy, non-visible parts of, of fintech because there's so much working in the background constantly that needs further refining or building from a provision point of view that you know you don't see that infrastructure and money, but it's hugely significant and it's, it's extremely valuable uh, to create and build. So if you're looking at, at Africa just as a whole, there's a very long journey and fragmentation to bringing that ecosystem together, big ecosystems together from a consumer point of view and from a, from a business point of view and from an infrastructure point of view. There's so much left to build and stitch together from a fundamental that you're going to see Africa for the next 10 years have a huge, huge runway in this build. Now, who's going to build it most cost effectively and create value out of it is going to be your key winners. But the opportunity clearly is there. I mean, just alone in the conversation we've had now, not even starting fresh conversations, if you if you really paid attention to what, what Zach was talking about with offline banking, 
you know, the opportunity is there from offline banking, but if I separate the conversation from offline banking to data, right, and building records yeah. and building history of these people, the next businesses and revenue lines I can build on the back of that for that ecosystem and other ecosystems and replicate across Africa is monumental. You're talking about credit risk, you're talking about risk profiling, you're talking about lending, you're talking about behavioral pattern sciences, you're talking Insurance. about movement of goods, services, people, and that data, I mean, you haven't even started collecting fragmented data to monetize in a, in, a, in a financial opportunity, let alone in an economy concept of movement of currencies, goods, and services. So the measurement of, 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 of Africa and what it's going to do and how it's going to do things, we take it for granted that, that, that this opportunity to capture that knowledge is there. I mean, we understand from you know, the latest movies you see on Wall Street about these old, old things that happen where if you have a trade piece of trade information two seconds before your competitors or 30 seconds before your competitors, the amount of money you can make on those, on those opportunities from a dual, pure data play can amount in hundreds of millions of dollars in difference. Here, we haven't even got to that stage yet from a fundamental point of view, let alone getting to that point in the next 10 to 15 years. So from my perspective, the basics of fundamental provision on a B2B or a B2C perspective for financial services in Africa is, is not winner takes all. There's room for four or five players, uh, at least in each market, in each segment. And then the next stories that evolve out of it later on, it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. You probably think that people like Amazon are biding their time, waiting for someone to do all the work. Yeah. Because it's easier for them to buy somebody and let them run things and then plug into Amazon rather than Amazon wanting to go along that journey and build it themselves. And will Amazon have the capacity to do it? 100%. Do they have the money to do it? 300%. You know, So different people have different strategies. But the people who are investing and putting time in Africa, not only from a funding perspective like our friends act, but the business operators and builders, yeah, there's, there's history to be made there. So... So Zach, in, in you know, my question to you is is fundamentally from a from a provision of fintech, is it B two B or B two C that's that's really prominent, um, which which is showing more promise in the short window of let's say a five to seven year perspective of returning capital, and has the the B two B or the B two C story gain traction where are you seeing that money coming into the market I mean, where do you see who's delivering the results yeah it's a great question i get i get i get asked that a lot i think the more the more sexy tangible products tend to be b2c because they're easy to understand and touch and feel um the reality is from a funding perspective you're going to struggle getting funding into b2c companies or fintechs in africa um, right simply because so i was i was i was i was actually speaking to someone Morning about this is one of the things that I'm most excited about Africa tech in the next few years is actually MA. So I see, so contrary to popular belief, because corporate Africa tends to be very acquisitive purely out of FOMO. I mean, I'm using a lot of millennial words here because. <laughs> Because they have no, Gaurav's earlier point about the patchwork, such a brilliant example. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that again. <laughs> banks, legacy banks and insurance companies, the insurance industry in Africa is so incredibly powerful. You've got five major insurers. You've got Sanlam, you've got Old Mutual, you've got Discovery, you've got Hollard. They have their roots all across the continent. There is so little innovation within the banking and insurance industry across Africa that the only way they can grow is through M&A. And what these banks and insurance companies do is they will on purpose refuse to take minority stakes at seed and series A because your terms are preposterous. So fintech founders in Africa have wisened up to not taking money from Standard Bank or EcoBank at the sort of seed stage because they're like, what are you guys doing? Like literally it's a blip on your radar. You're gonna spend more in accounting costs on a 2% stake in a seed state startup and completely screw up your Basel to, you know, capital adequacy requirements from an investing perspective. But what a lot of banks and insurance companies do really well on the content is they do a lot of light lean experiments with FinTechs 
through their own regulatory sandboxes and they'll do POCs and pilots and they'll see a fintech grow and then come in and offer a price to buy them out. Standard Bank did that with SnapScan, Omichul did that with 227, and you're seeing a lot of corporate M&A in the works. And I think that will increase significantly next year. Sorry, this year and next year. Because the reality, guys, is IPOs are not an attractive route to liquidity. Um, we're seeing that in the US and Europe now in Asia and Africa. I mean, we've had three or four IPOs in tech in Africa in the last three years, Jumia being the biggest of them, you don't get fair prices if you list. So we're seeing a lot of vertical m and so corporate Africa buying fintechs. But what's even more interesting is consolidation amongst fintechs, right? So Flutterway, for example, is getting increasingly more acquisitive with, with payment providers that integrate into its own supply chain, right? Um, re, uh, embedded finance in, in, in the retail tech industry. So Trade Depot, Market Force, Circle Watch, increasingly acquisitive to gain market share on the continent from a regional expansion perspective. So I actually see exits in African early stage tech, fintech and embedded fintech being a bigger driver of investment activity this year, next year than we've seen in the past. And that's an important thing. Always start with the end goal in mind. So if you know who's going to be buying you out and why they're going to be buying you out, it makes a lot more sense to think of why you'd come in. Uh, I just wanted to add that point in because exits are super important. A lot of folks that aren't familiar <clears throat> with tech in Africa always say, where are the exits? You know, run it for your, just for your sort of information and for, your, and for the viewer's information here. In the last three years, 2020, 21, 22, there were, take a wild guess at how many exits African tech startups had. This is not information that's ever made public. So you will not see this in Crunchbase. But there were the more than mean what, IPOs, MA? Or just exits where there was a liquidity event. I'm, I'm not talking about just, there were more than 100 exits in African, what? more than 100 exits. <laughs> but here, here, here's a caveat. A large corporate buying you and acqui hiring you or mm. a, a competitor buying you if it's a stock for stock. So the majority mm. of exits are cash, uh, sorry, are stock exits, not cash exits. Still an exit, mm. liquidity event. Yeah. Majority of exits never get reported publicly. But M&A. Okay. M &A. So there's, a, and, and more than 90% of, of those exits were corporate M&A or, or um larger institutions, MTN, NASPERS, mm. gosh, Old Mutual, Sanlam, Vodacom. There's a lot of M&A that happens, but it's not publicly disclosed. Disclosed. If you go to vodacom.co.za, it's Vodacom South Africa, and look at all their fully operating subsidiaries, those were at one point startups. Oh, right? wow. But it's not disclosed on the Wall Street Journal or TechCrunch because it's private. So there are a lot of exits that never get reported, but if you know, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling. And if you, if our viewers are really keen, I can, I can probably share that information, you know, in anonymity or whatever. Mm. But you know, stuff does happen. Um, it's not just people said, "Oh, Zach, the only exit was Paystack being sold to Stripe." I'm like, <coughs> that's what was reported. Mm. A lot more than happens. And that's a very important point for mm. VCs and angels because there is a path to liquidity irrespective of what the multiple is. Yeah. Super, super interesting. Zach, I'd love to carry this conversation on for another hour, but we've talked, no. I think, more than an hour already. The audience wants to listen to you um, or follow up with you or track, you know, just what's the best way? I don't know, LinkedIn, Twitter, website? No, Twitter, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, email. Email is the best. Email. Yeah. yeah. Just email, good old fashioned email is the best. Thank you. Zach, for thanks so much. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Bye. Thanks Bye. so much.